Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Read the Bible with Elder Linda. So glad you joined me. We have a really good lesson today. And this is your first time coming to the channel. Here on the channel, uh, we read the scriptures together. We make sure we understand what we're reading and we make application to our lives. And I also post a new video by every Wednesday. Sometimes it's up as early as Tuesday evening, but uh, late Tuesday. But definitely by Wednesday it's posted. But anyway, glad you joined me. Um, you know, give me a thumb up or subscribe to the channel uh, so you can find out when the, each video is posted uh, uh, if you subscribe to the YouTube channel. And also remember that any comments or questions are welcome and you can use the comment and um, the comment section on YouTube and on Facebook. <clears throat> but last week we were in um, Matthew chapter 21 and we read down as far as verse 22. Uh, we talked about the triumphal entry. We talked about the cleansing of the temple and the cursing of the fig tree. We got that far because uh, there was a lot of information in that chapter. Uh, but this week we're going to try, the, the plan is to finish Matthew chapter 21 uh, and perhaps start on chapter 22 of Matthew. And uh, just remember this is the last, still we're in the last week of Jesus' life while he was here on this earth, uh, the Holy Week or Passion Week whichever one you want to call it. Um, and in chapter 22, uh, we're going to talk about, he's going to talk about the, where the chief priests are going to ask him some questions, uh, going to question his authority and discuss, he's going to discuss two parables. Um, I'm sorry, at the end of chapter 21. Uh, that's the last part of chapter 21 that we're going to go through. But again, this is, like I said, this is, this is uh, Holy Week. Uh, the triumphal entry was on Sunday when the palm branches was waved. Um, Monday, he cleansed the temple. Uh, also on Monday, he cursed the fig tree. On Tuesday, which we're going to talk about today, uh, he's going to have his authority challenged by the, the chief priests um, and the elders. And he's also going to give two parables uh, kind of in, in answer to them trying to check him and trying to catch him up in something. These parables are going to be directed at them. So anyway, let's just start with a word of prayer and jump right in because we have a lot to cover. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Father, we just love you. We praise you. We honor you. We appreciate you. Holy Spirit, we give you the glory. We just thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Father, I pray for all those that are listening for all those that will listen. Lord, we just have joy in our heart knowing that we belong to you, God. Thank you for teaching us about your word. Thank you for enlightening us and showing us things that we've not seen before. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming in and being the teacher. And we're careful to give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Like I always say, I don't care how many times you read the Bible, there's always something new for you to learn. Uh, so even though we're reading through the Bible, there's no way that we're going to exhaust all the information in these chapters. So we're just scratching the surface. And I guarantee you, the next time you go back and read through again, Holy Spirit's going to show you something else that you didn't see before. Amen. Because that's just how he is. Amen. He just keeps on revealing and, and showing us and taking us from glory to glory. Okay, so let's just start. Uh, there was a couple things in uh, last, week's less, last week's lesson tongue twister, that I wanted to um, just mention briefly again, or not again, but that I didn't mention last week that I wanted to bring out. One of the things I said last week was that, remember we were talking about the triumphal entry and how they waved palm branches in front of Jesus as he came in riding on the donkey. And... Uh, they put their coats in the palm branches right in front of him, you know, as, as act of uh, honor and 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 uh, uh, royalty, showing that they received him as the king of kings. Uh, and I had said that uh, this is where that started because remember I talked about how we honor the bride by putting flowers in front of her before she walks. We still kind of do that now about the red carpet in Hollywood. I mentioned that that we still, you know, the red carpet they represent who's who. You know, it's of course not on the level of Jesus, but um, it's just a way to represent the who's who. And, um, but it did not start with Jesus in the triumphal entry. Um, 
doing a little bit more research in the second Kings chapter nine, verse 13, uh, they actually, in the Old Testament, laid coats down to honor King Jehu, J-E-H-U. If you want to read about that in second Kings chapter nine, verse 13. Uh, <clears throat> so check that out. So actually this laying the coats down and waving the branches and giving honor to the people that come up was started way back before, uh, before the New Testament. And also, I wanted to bring out that Jesus, in the trial for entry, remember we talked about how uh, this is also the week of Passover, or that was the week of Passover, starting with the trial for entry, the week of Passover. And uh, there were thousands of people in Jerusalem who had traveled there for the annual Passover feast. And so they were, they were, so they were there, the, there was a big buzz about the Passover, but there was also a buzz and the place was set on fire when they found out Jesus was there and coming. Because think about it, Jesus had not too long ago raised Lazarus from the dead. Okay, that was a big thing to raise somebody from the dead. So, so people wanted to see who he was. And, uh, you know, they're calling, they're calling out to him, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to the son of David. And we, we talked about Hosanna means saved. And one other place says it means saved now. So, um, not sure if they really had an idea of really what was going on. Uh, from, from the people's perspective, they were underneath bondage to Rome, to the Romans. And they saw Jesus as their savior who was going to deliver them from the bondage of Rome. So <clears throat> Hosanna saved now. I'm sure in their head, they're thinking, okay, here's our savior. He's going to come and he's going to, uh, come with his army and he's going to deliver us and set us free from all this, this Roman uh, bondage that we're in. Uh, the Jews were thinking this. So when he entered Jerusalem, the other uh, scripture I wanted to bring out was in um, Luke chapter 19, verse uh, 41 through 44. Because when Jesus actually entered Jerusalem, he entered in weeping. He weeped when he entered Jerusalem because... Uh, well, let's just read it. I'm going to read that part in Luke verse 19, verse 41 through 44 says, but as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way of peace, but now it is too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts, which is trenches trenches against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. So in other words, you're going to be surrounded by your enemy. He's talking about attack. The enemy is going to come in and attack the city of Jerusalem. Um, they will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place talking about Jerusalem. So this is why he's weeping because Jesus know what's getting, what's going to happen to them. This is going to happen in about 40 years from, from the date that he's riding, riding into Jerusalem and 70 AD, uh, Jerusalem is going to be attacked and it's going to be torn down. The temple, the buildings is going to be crushed. It's going to be, it's going to be devastated. And, and here he says, he says, because you did not recognize, you did not recognize it when God visited you. Wow, that is something to say. Because you didn't recognize it when God visited you. And I'm in the New Living Translation. But that's basically what's going on. Jesus is God in the flesh who's come down and they don't, they don't realize uh, how divine he is. They just, they're just looking at him, most of them, as their deliverer. Oh, he's going to come here and fight and fight against Rome and, and set us free. So when you think of it that way, you can understand why, or you can see why by the end of the week, instead of saying Hosanna uh, to the son of David, uh, instead of praising him, by the end of the week, by Friday, they're going to be saying crucify him. Because he's not going to perform like they think he's going to perform. He's not going to come there and set them free from the Romans. You know, so yeah, they're, they're, they're not going to be happy with him.
But anyway, I wanted to bring out that scripture uh, that in verse that was Luke chapter 19, verse 41 through 44, where just before Jesus went into Jerusalem, as he was going and he was weeping because he knew they, they don't get it. They don't get it. But still, it was his triumphal entry. He, he went in and declared himself as king. Also, just want to mention about the cursing of the fig tree. Um, <clears throat> because when he when he cursed the fig tree because it had no fruit. Remember, we talked about uh, how the uh, Pharisees and the, the chief priests and all them had brought forth no fruit. And Jesus was basically talking about them. Okay, you're cursed from this day forward. You know, there's not going to be any fruit from you. And just want to bring out for us, how can we make sure we bear fruit if we abide in him? And it tells us that in John 15, verse 7 through 8. So if you abide in me and my words abide in you, uh, you'll ask what you will and it shall be done for you. Here it is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. And so shall you be my disciples. So that word abide means to stay. So Jesus said, if you just hang with me, if you just stay with me, I'm going to make sure you bring forth a whole lot of fruit. You won't be like that fig tree that I cursed because you're going to have fruit when uh, people come to eat off you. And, and you can find that in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, it talks about the fruit of the spirit that we should look for in our lives. And what is that fruit? Love, joy, peace, uh, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance. Which is another word for temperance is self-control. Ha! Ah, I like that one. I need a lot of that one in my life as well. But that's the fruit that we're going to have if we just hang with him, stay with him, you know, uh, get, get in relationship with him. We will have fruit. Amen. All right. So let's just go on here. <clears throat> that was the last one I wanted to talk about. Yeah. All right, so we are going to go to chapter 20, I mean, um, Matthew chapter 21, verse 23. We're going to read 23 to 27. And this is how they, uh, they were questioning Jesus' authority. And I'm in the uh, New Living Translation. It says, when Jesus returned to the temple and began teaching... The leading priests and elders came up to him and they demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right? Jesus said, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. If you answer one question, Jesus replied, did John's authority to baptize come from heaven or was it merely human, merely human? They talked it over among themselves. Now, if we say it was from heaven, he will ask us, why didn't we believe John? But if we say it was merely human, we'll be mobbed because the people believe John was a prophet. So they finally replied, we don't know. <laughs> so then Jesus responded, then I won't tell you what authority I do, by what authority I do these things. Jesus was wise. And, and if we listen to him, he'll help us to be wise too in our responses and how we answer people. But um, here they tried to trick him up and uh, asking him, and, and by what authority are you cleansing the temple? By what authority are you healing people? What By what authority did you curse his feet? What, by what authority are you doing all these things? And he said, I'll tell you by what authority you just tell me. Uh, if John was from above, if he, if he was ordained from God, or, or was he just uh, merely a, a human, merely uh, meant for mankind, merely human? And so, yeah, if they said, well, John was from God, then the question would be, well, when he said repent, why didn't you repent? Why didn't you give your life over to to uh, to, to to God? Why didn't you repent of your sins? And if they said, well, John was just human. Then the people, there was a lot of people out there, they would have mobbed them because the people believed that John was truly a prophet. So they were in a rock, between a rock and a hard place and they, they chickened out and said, well, we don't, we're not going to answer you. And he said, well, I'm not going to answer you either. <laughs> Jesus was smart. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go to uh, verse 28 through 32. We're talking about the parable of the two sons. Now, remember, they just asked him this question. So now... He's got a couple of parables that he's going to throw on them. So in uh, verse 28, it says, but what do you think about 
this. What do you think about this? A man with two sons told the older son, son, go out and work in the, in the vineyard today. The son answered, no, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and went anyway. Then the father told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Which of the two obeyed his father? Then replied, they replied, the first. Then Jesus explained his meaning. I tell you the truth. Now he's going to tell them why he, why, he's, why he gave this parable because he's talking about them. I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors. Now, tax collectors were people that collected the money and they were Jews that collected the money for the Romans, but they always pocketed some for themselves. So they, they were like cheating the people and taking advantage of the people. So the people hated these tax collectors, but they were Jews that were hated. He said, uh, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. Where John the Baptist came, and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him. While the tax collectors, people that knew they were sinning, and the prostitutes did believe. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. So he, said, he gave this parable of these two young men. Uh, their father had asked them to go into the vineyard, and one of them said, no, I'm not going. But he changed his mind and he went. He repented. Uh, the other one said, yes, I'm going. And he didn't go. So what can we get from this? Because uh, both sons were asked to work in the, in the vineyard. So it's not what you say, but it's what you do. This is what I want us to, to think about. It's not so much what comes out of your mouth. It's what, what are you doing? What are you doing with your hands? What are you doing? What does your life say? Uh, there's a saying that says, actions speak louder than words. You know, you can say all you want, but people are watching what you do. Uh, another saying that I want us to remember is practice what you preach. That's a good one. Because people are not going to listen to you if you're saying all these wonderful things that, ooh, my, my preacher said this at church, ooh, and this, and, but your life looks a mess and you're doing everything that you think you're big enough to do except for live for Jesus. Okay, that's that's a that's a contradiction, you know. So your mouth is saying one thing, but your life is saying something else. God doesn't want that. He wants our life and the words we speak line up, line up. Does that mean we're perfect? No. That we're gonna make some mistakes, but when you make a mistake, we have the blood of Jesus. We have an advocate with the Father for us to say, okay, God, I fell down, and you get back up, you dust yourself off. So, so there's room for us to make mistakes because we're under grace. But there's not room for us to uh, continue in sin. The scripture says, shall we continue in, in sin? No, uh, of course not. We don't take advantage of his grace, but the grace is there for when we fall. So anyway, practice what you preach. Uh, what, you know, because we can know all the, I like to say Christianese. You can know all the right words. You can know when to say hallelujah, when to shout, when to raise your hand. When you say preach, preach, preacher, you know, you can have all that down pat. And look like the holiest person in the church. But what is your life saying? When you leave that church building, when you're not around everybody that's looking at you, that's what God is looking at. That's how he can tell where you are and who you are. And if you actually are one of his. We tell other people to forgive. Do we forgive? We, and we know the scripture. You're supposed to give seven times, 70. You know, we, we quote the scripture. But do we really do it? Because it takes a lot of work to do that. I'm telling you, that's an ongoing thing. It's probably like every other day or so, it's going to be somebody that's going to push your button the wrong way and you're going to have to forgive. You're going to have to uh, show some grace and mercy. And it's all a test for us. God's growing us up. He's giving us opportunity after opportunity to learn how to live in grace, to learn how to be uh, forgiving, to forgive people. But you can't fool God. He sees everything. He knows our hearts. So if we have said yes to Jesus, let it not be in words only. Our life should reflect that we are living for Jesus. There should be something in your life that shows that you belong to him. Come on now, we're representing him. Now, I didn't say you have to be perfect, but there should be something that shows that you're representing him. Some kind of change should be going on. 
When we have truly said yes to Jesus, we truly begin to act like Jesus would act in every situation. Not perfect, but allowing God to change us and to change us into his image. Because this is what this whole process is all about right now. He's changing us into his image. So you have to be willing to change. Jesus told them, he said, the prostitutes and the crooked tax collectors are going to beat you, chief, you uh, scribes and Pharisees in because... They repented and you, you can't even repent. So that's the key. You know, God looks on the heart. Even David did some horrible things, but he repented. He was able to say, God, forgive me. You know, when he did all that stuff with Bathsheba and messed up, he, he repented uh, when he was found out. He said, you're the man. He repented. So make sure our heart is calling, causing us to repent if we need to repent and to turn around and do the right thing. Because God prefers, as he said, I would that you were hot or cold. If you were lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. So God doesn't want us on the fence. You know, we, he, we shouldn't be uh, Christians that walk in the fence. Where, okay, I'm not too, um, you know, I'm not too much into the God thing, but I'm not too much into the world thing either. So I'm just, I'm just going to stay right here on this fence. That's a bad place to be in. He said, I would that you were hot or cold. In Revelation 3, 16, he was talking about the Laodicean church. I worried that you was hot with cold. He said, because if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. God's not even happy with that. Be, make up your mind. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But he caught the, the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verse 27. We haven't gotten it yet. But they were called hypocrites. He said they look beautiful on the outside, but inside are dead people's bones. Oh my gosh, we don't want it, we don't want that to be said of us. You know that we know just what to say, we know how to look, we look real holy, but inside you're just talking about sister so and so like crazy. Ooh, I can't stand her. Ooh. Oh my gosh, no, no, no. Now I'm not saying that sister so and so is not gonna get on your nerves, but when she do it, and if that thought come to you, ooh, I can't stand her, your next thought should be, God help me. Jesus, I don't want to feel this way. Help me to love sister so-and-so because she is getting on my last nerve. You can be honest with God, but make sure you're getting that out, amen? You don't want to stay there and, and think that's okay to feel that way. Okay, so let's go a little bit further about the parable of the evil farmers, verse 33 through 46. So now listen to another story. A certain landowner planted a vineyard, built a wall around it, dug it, dug a pit for pressing out the grape juice and built a lookout tower. Then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and moved to another country. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent his servants to collect his share crop. But the farmers grabbed his servants and beat one, killed one, and stoned another. So the landowner sent a larger group of his servants to collect for him, but the results were the same. Finally, the owner sent his son, hmm, thinking, surely they will respect my son. And this is representing Jesus. But when the tenant farmers saw his son coming, they said to one another, here comes the heir of this estate. Come on, let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they grabbed him, dragged him out of the vineyard and murdered him. When the owner of the vineyard returns, Jesus asked, what do you think that he would do to those farmers? Verse 41, the religious leaders replied, he will put the wicked man to a horrible death, the wicked men to a horrible death and lease the vineyard to others who will give him his share of the crop after each harvest. Then Jesus asked them, didn't you ever read this in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. He's talking straight to these, uh, the chief priests and these elders. The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce the proper fruit. Anyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone it falls on. Then the leading priests and the Pharisees heard this parable. They realized that he was telling the story against them and they, that against them, they were the wicked farmers. They wanted to arrest him. 
but they were afraid of the crowds who considered Jesus to be a prophet. So these last two parables were about them. Uh, and, and the last parable, uh, Jesus showed them, okay, I've, I've sent, he sent prophets. He sent John the Baptist and you didn't accept what John had to say. Uh, uh, my prophets have been coming to, to my people all these years and a lot of them were, were killed and, and, and uh, are going to be killed. And they also wanted to uh, kill Jesus. So, of course, Jesus is talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. God planted the vineyard. The religious leaders were supposed to take care of it. They're supposed to take care of God's people. You're supposed to cherish uh, what God has entrusted you with. You know, he entrusted you with the word. He entrusted you with the truth, with the scriptures. And you, you, you misinterpreted it. And then some of them you added to the scriptures and you put more bondages on people. So they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Instead of the people being free, the people are in bondage underneath these elders and chief priests. They added a lot of legalism. He said they ended up killing the prophets and then finally killing Jesus. God will take the kingdom from them. So those that have not uh, taken advantage of the truth that they had and the preciousness of what God had given them and didn't do right by God's people, well, it's going to be taken away from them. Now, just uh, really quick, we're not going to read it, but um, with Jesus coming back in the Old Testament, remember um, Matthew's always reminding us that things were uh, uh, came to pass and he reminded the Jews that this is what it was said in the Old Testament. So this is your Messiah. He's always confirming it through scriptures from the past, scriptures in the, in the Old Testament to show that this is what it says. This is where this is him that's coming. He's satisfied that prophecy. Well, Daniel chapter nine, verse twenty four through twenty five, which is really interesting because Daniel was born uh, about two six hundred and over six hundred years before Jesus came. And an angel came to Daniel and told him exactly when Jesus would be coming. Uh, he told Daniel it was going to be 483 years. He got that through 69 blocks of seven years when you, when you get through reading it. And that comes to 483 years. And uh, the angel told him that when God, when, when God allows the people to go back and build Jerusalem, we haven't read about that yet, but Jerusalem is going to be destroyed in 70 AD. And they're, the people are going to be allowed, the Jews will be allowed to go back and build it. So the angel was telling Daniel when, when the decree is given by Cyrus that they should go out and rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild their homeland, they're allowed to go back. 483 years from that time, Jesus will be coming. And to the day, to the day almost, uh, Jesus came, right? 483 years after the decree was given. And they said the decree was given like 445 BC, something like that. And so 483 years after that, uh, it was about 35 or 36 AD, uh, Jesus was doing his ministry. So it came right in the middle of his ministry. So just, just saying that, sharing it with you, how God, uh, God's word is sure. 600 and or more years before Jesus ever came, it was prophesied that he was going to come. It was prophesied almost to the exact date that his, when his ministry was going to start. And that's when it started. Amen. Amen. So let's just, um, we're going to stop there uh, because I don't really want to start anything else. Uh, next week we'll be on chapter 22, but I just wanted to invite anybody that has not accepted Christ into your heart, uh, please do so. Go to my page, my uh, Read Through the Bible with Elder Linda. There's two videos there called um, Sinner's Prayer. It's on a playlist called The Sinner's Prayer and Teaching About Salvation. And those two videos will lead you to Christ. They'll tell you why you need Jesus and give you all the scriptures to explain to you why you need Jesus. So please go on there and give your life to Christ before it's too late because tomorrow is not promised. And we want you all to be in the ark of safety. Amen. Amen. Let's just close with prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you. I praise you for all those listening. Holy Spirit, we just thank you, Lord God, that you're going to allow your fruit to grow in us, oh God. Father, that if we abide in you, Lord Jesus, 
You said we bear much fruit. Lord, we just thank you for your love, your joy, your peace, for all the fruit that you've given us, oh God. We thank you, Lord God, for keeping us, oh God. Give us that staying power. Give us that keeping power. And I praise you and I honor you and give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you and see you next week.